All right, so let's just uh, start with some review of the reactions that we learned last time. Right, so take a minute and predict the products of these three reactions here. So for this first one here, again, remember with these alkenes, we've always got the same basic sort of uh, format for our reactions. 
where we're adding something new to either side of that double bond, right? These addition reactions. Uh, so I'm going to start with my sort of carbon backbone here. I'm going to get rid of this double bond because that's being replaced. Okay. And so for this one, I'm adding hydrogen to one side and chlorine to the other side. But for these particular reactions, it was important which carbon we choose to put that chlorine on. Right? So which one should I put the chlorine on? The red carbon or the blue carbon? Blue. The blue, right? The more highly substituted carbon is going to be the one that gets that chlorine. The hydrogen, which you don't have to explicitly draw, but you can if you want, needs to go on that red carbon. Okay, that's because we call it, we had a special name for these type of reactions where they're selective to the more highly substituted carbon. And that was this fancy term, Markovnikov. Clearly some Russian scientist or something like that who discovered it. All right, for this next one, same sort of idea. I'm going to add something to either side of that double bond. In this case, I don't have to worry about any Markovnikov business because uh, I'm just adding a chlorine to either side. Right? But am I done if I just do that? No. What do I got to do? Dashes and wedges, right? We got to show the stereochemistry for our ring. And importantly, one of these chlorines is going to go on a wedge, which means that the other one needs to be on a dash, right? They need to be pointed on opposite sides. So you could have, uh, it would have been perfectly fine to have done it like this as well. Either one of those are equivalent. Okay. Um, and we said that that's because this one, our little special consideration was that it was an anti-addition, right? Meaning they added to opposite sides of the ring. And then for this last one, I don't know if we've seen this, I don't know if I've done an example of this, but these little cyclo uh, triangles here, if there's three carbons, what would that be? Cyclo propane, okay? Not terribly stable, okay? Highly reactive, but they do exist, right? So the little triangles would just be a three carbon ring. Um, so for these reactions here, these halohydrins, we have to remember that it has this Markovnikov aspect to it, as well as being an anti-addition, right? So those two considerations that we had for these previous two reactions all rolled into one. All right, so I'm going to be adding an OH onto one side and a chlorine onto the other side. Uh, importantly, what's going to go on the more substituted carbon, the red carbon? The OH, okay? So in this case, it's going to be that OH that goes on the more highly substituted carbon. Um, so I'm going to put my OH group here. Again, since it's anti, I'm going to make sure that these are sticking in opposite directions. I guess I can put it right on top. All right, and what am I going to have to do to this methyl group? Yeah, so it needs to be the opposite direction of where that OH group is. So, because I made that OH group a wedge, I'm going to have to turn that methyl group into a dash. Cool. All right. So, this is what we would call the substrate reagent and product combination for a reaction. Pretty much the most basic piece of information that you could know about a reaction. What substrate combines with what reagent to produce what product? Okay? The substrate is the organic molecule, right? So necessarily the ones with the carbons and hydrogens. The reagent is what's transforming that organic molecule. Um, I've sort of been doing it like this. Another very common way to display the reagents is actually to have them sitting on top of the arrow like this. 
That would be a perfectly equivalent way of writing these reactions, right? So my substrate is my organic molecule, my reagent is what's transforming that organic molecule, and my product is what comes out the other side, right? So for every reaction we learn, the most basic piece of information we can know is that substrate reagent product combination. Okay, again, what combines with what to produce what? Uh, every once in a while, there's going to be this extra piece of information we want to know. Um, in the two semester course, a lot of these reactions we would learn actual mechanisms for. We're not going to do too many mechanisms here in this course, like the electron pushing arrows. But what we do need to know for these two reactions in particular is the intermediates of these reactions. Okay, kind of a picture as to why we have the particular selectivity of our product that we do. Okay, so let's take this one right here. All right, the last thing we need to cover about these ones. So again, these were our hydrohalogenation reactions. And we want to talk about the intermediates. Maybe. That word looks weird to me right now, but I'm not a great speller and I'm going to roll with it. All right. Um, is that correct? Is there an I here? Why does that look so wrong? Anyways, whatever. Doesn't matter. And anyway, we're talking about the intermediates of this reaction here. All right. Um, and so what happens is actually this double bond kind of reaches out and grabs this hydrogen first. And that forms what we call a carbocation intermediate. Okay, uh, carbocation, what does that word cation mean? Positive charge, exactly. So this is going to be a carbon with a positive charge. Okay, and in particular for this substrate, that positive charge is going to go on the more substituted carbon. That's why we get selectivity, that Markovnikov selectivity of our uh, product is because of this carbocation intermediate, which forms on the more substituted carbon. Okay, so in this reaction here, first this carbocation intermediate is formed, and then what happens is the chloride ion comes and reacts with that intermediate to give us our product. Oh, my gosh. Did I just, hold up. What's wrong with my carbocation? What did I tell you it was going to form on? On the more substituted carbon. And where did I put it? On the wrong dang carbon, all right? I don't know, y'all. It's way early this morning. Um, but yes, I definitely, this needs to go over here, on the more substituted carbon. Because again, that's the whole logic, is that our carbocation forms on that more substituted carbon. My bad. Right? That's how we get our product here. All right, and so these arrows are what we call the mechanism. And again, we're not going to sort of uh, focus too much on the mechanism here. The important part is that you can draw me the intermediate of this reaction here, that carbocation intermediate where our uh, carbocation forms on the more highly substituted carbon. The reason for this is very similar to what we talked about with radicals. Carbocation stability. Remember we said that tertiary radicals were more stable than secondary radicals, were more stable than primary radicals, 
And the same is true for carbocations, right? So again, the carbocation is always going to form on the more substituted carbon because the more substituted carbon has the more stable carbocation. We're also going to talk about the intermediates of our halogenation reactions. So taking a cyclic alkene, really any alkene, but for the cyclic alkenes we have this uh, stereoselectivity to worry about. So everybody just take a second and predict me my products here. So remember the whole shtick about these mm -hmm. is that they have this anti-addition. So you're going to add your bromine to opposite sides of the ring. <laughs> All right, we called this an anti-addition. And this is only something we had to worry about with cyclic substrates. All right, truthfully, if we had like a normal old alkene, um, we would have to consider this anti-addition as well. It would give us a sort of stereochemically distinct product, but in a way that's like a little bit too advanced for this course. So we're only really talking about our cis and trans isomers, right? So our rather stereo isomers. And this would of course be which one? The cis or the trans here? Trans. trans. Right? There is another type of stereochemistry called RS stereochemistry that we're not going to really get into. Okay? So anyways, only for the rings. Long story short, only have to worry about it for the rings. Okay? Um, again, we can sort of uh, do our uh, mechanism here, and we don't really need to worry about the mechanism so much as the intermediate, but just to kind of show. Um, in this reaction, you also have that double bond reaching out and grabbing one of these bromines. Breaks that bond there, okay? But bromine, with all these pairs of electrons it's got going on, actually reaches back and reacts with one of our, and forms a new bond with one of these other carbons. And so we get this cyclic, all right? So if I'm gonna draw the intermediate here, where used to be my double bond, again, I'll color these carbons just so we can see. Now I'm going, whoops. Now I'm going to have this intermediate here where my bromine is attached to both of those carbons and has a positive charge. This is the coolest uh, named intermediate of all of the intermediates in our organic chemistry. This is what we call a bromonium ion. It's actually bridge halogen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would, I guess a chloronium ion would be for chlorine or whatever, but yes. <laughs> all right. And importantly, because of this uh, cyclic structure, this little triangle that's formed, Obviously, these two bonds have to be pointed 
in the same direction, right? If I'm forming this triangle, I can't form it on opposite sides of my ring. And so this leads to our anti-addition because the other bromine has no choice but to come along and attack from the other side, which is why I end up getting this trans intermediate, our trans product there. Okay. Again, the actual mechanism, the arrows, isn't what we need to be worried about, but you do need to be able to draw me that intermediate, that bromonium ion intermediate, that cyclic intermediate there. So in this case, it's Say it again. Cis, the other one is no, no, no. So, the inter so here, those two bonds are pointed in the same side, for sure, but they're both bound to the same thing, right? They're both bound to that bromi, uh, brom whatever, bromonium ion. Okay, um, so this intermediate, I mean, I guess you could say that it's like a cis intermediate because they're pointed on the same side, um, but it's just an intermediate, right? It only exists, it, importantly, intermediates exist for like femtoseconds, right? They are very transient. They, they exist only for a very short period of time. They're highly unstable and thus will react to go to the product side very quickly. When, when we draw it, do we have to draw the other side if it's a... Uh... You don't need this part here. This is me just illustrating why it has that anti-addition. You need to be able to draw me these intermediates. Okay. All right, so then let's just practice real quick. Give me the intermediates in these two reactions here. All right, so if I color my carbons on either side of my double bond, uh, where is the, so first of all, the intermediate for these hydrohalogenation reactions we called what? Carbocations, right? So that would be the positively charged carbon and which carbon is going to get the positive charge? The red carbon? Or the blue carbon? The red. the red, right? The more substituted carbon. Okay, so that's my intermediate for that reaction. Um, for these, we have these cyclic intermediates here. I'm going to put my halogen into this triangle, and importantly, it's going to have a positive charge on that halogen as well. Hey, don't forget the charge. Uh, we could be good and draw these both as wedges or both as dashes, 
but honestly, you don't need to because there's no way for them to be pointed on opposite sides, right? By drawing that as a triangle, as a cyclic structure, it's just assumed they're on the same side because there would be no way to do it where they were on opposite sides. But I'm also charge. The charge is a very important, I mean, yes. I mean, you'd have, if you did just this, you wouldn't get credit because you'd be missing that formal charge on that halogen. Yeah, so we want to remember to put that positive charge on that halogen. Okay. Cool. So you got two more reactions, what are called hydration reactions. All right, and they're called hydration reactions because we're going to take our alkene. Um, and what do we think we're going to be adding if it's a hydration reaction? Anybody guess? Somebody said it. Water. Hydration, water, right? So we're going to be adding H2O, okay? An H is going to go on one side and an OH on the other side. So on one side is an OH, and on the other side is an H, right? So combined, we're adding H2O to our alkene. Um, so we're going to have two different ways to do this, all right? So let's take an example alkene, and I use this one here. Um, and by two different ways to do this, I mean two different reagents, reagents that will both accomplish this hydration reaction. All right, this first one is what's called a oxymercuration. Oxymercuration. Mer All right, and that's because there's this mercury based catalyst that we're going to use. HG, mercury acetate is what it's called. Okay, so this is kind of our first example of a set of reagents that's like this big, ugly stack of reagents here, all right? The good news is, is we don't have to have this memorized. We do need to be able to sight recognize it, right? By that, I mean you need to sort of be able to, on the exam when that's written, you need to be able to recognize that as a package deal and know what it does. So remember last time I talked about making these flashcards. That's why flashcards are really important, so that you can just kind of look at it and sort of, you don't even have to really have the details memorized, the fact that there's a two here. You don't have to have that crap memorized, but you need to be able to see something like this and know what it's going to do, right? Be able to sight recognize it, okay? So again, this is going to be this hydration reaction. We're going to put an OH on one side and an H on the other side. Okay. The other one is what's called a hydro 
borination reaction. And it uses this borane, BH3, with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. Um, here, well, so let me finish my color coding. All right, so here we also have a hydration product. So we're also adding H to one side and OH to the other. But I want everybody to take a second and try to spy the difference here between these two reactions. Both of them put an OH on one side, an H on the other side, but they do give us different products here. Yeah, exactly, right? That's what our hydroboronation is doing for us as opposed to our oxymercuration. Oxymercuration, OH on the more substituted carbon. Hydroboronation, the OH on the less substituted carbon. All right, what's that fancy term for sticking stuff on the more substituted carbon? That Russian dude's name? Markovnikov. So oxymercurations are Markovnikov reaction. Markov. When we put it on the less substituted carbon, these are what are called anti-Markovnikov reactions. All right, so we got two different types of hydration reactions. They both sort of add a hydrogen to one side and an OH on the other side. The difference is the regioselectivity, right? The first one will put it on the more highly substituted carbon. The second one puts that OH group on the less substituted carbon. All right, I think I mentioned it in passing before, uh, but what do we call molecules with that OH functional group? Does anybody remember? alcohols, right? So this is what we are generating here. These are alcohols that are our products. Because they all put an OH group on there. All right, so let's just make sure we got this down here. I'm going to take this same alkene and I'm going to do two different things with it. On the one side, I'm going to do my oxymercuration reaction, and on the other side, I'm going to do my hydroboronation reaction.
more room for myself here. So, this mercury right here is what I'm going to spy that's going to give away what reaction this one is here in terms of which carbon that OH group goes on. For my mercuration, my oxymercuration, again, I see that HG, that mercury. Am I going to put the OH on the red or the blue carbon? Yeah, mercury is the more substituted. All right, and likewise, I'm going to spy um, my BH3, that borane. All right, and that BH3 is going to tell me that in this reaction, the OH group goes on what, red or blue? my blue, the less substituted carbon. All right, so again, they're both are these big, ugly list of reagents here, right? But if we can spy the one like key thing that sort of will help us figure it out, again, HG, more substituted, BH3, less substituted. I don't know, come up with something stupid to get that drilled into your brain. I'm not, yeah, okay, cool. So now let's say that I came to you and I said, look, I got a whole stock room full of alkenes. Any alkene you can think of, I got it in my stock room, all right? And I need you to do some reaction that will generate the following product, the following alcohol. Okay, I want you to try to tell me what alkene you would start with and what reagent you would use in order to generate that particular alcohol, right? Again, it can be any alkene you can think of, any alkene in the world. I got a drawer full of alkenes here, take one of them Take a, uh, a reagent and transform it into my following product here. All right, so given what we've just discussed about these two hydration reactions, see if you can't figure out what reagent I would need and what alkene you would start with. I'll give you a hint. How many carbons should that alkene have? Four, how do we get four? Because that's how many I got in my product here, right? One, two, three, four. I'm not creating any carbons in, this rea in these reactions. I'm not destroying any carbons, right? So I got the same number of carbons on either side. So since my alcohol has four carbons, my alkene better have four carbons as well. Okay, so everybody take a second, see if we can't figure out what alkene we would start with and what reagent we would use.
All right, so how am I gonna do this? Sort of working backwards here, right? Again, I'm gonna need those same four carbons. They're gonna have to be arranged in essentially the same way that they are over here, just I'm gonna add a double bond. And importantly, this carbon that has that OH in my product, it has to be involved in that double bond, right? There's gotta be a double bond on that carbon to one of its neighbors. In this case, it's only got that one neighbor, so I only got one option, all right? And then in this reaction here, am I putting that OH group on the more substituted end of the alkene or the, uh, sorry, the more substituted end of the alkene or the less substituted end of the alkene? On the less one, right? So in that case, I'm gonna use that BH3. Okay, again, you don't need to be able to have these memorized, but if you're given a list of them, you wanna be able to sight recognize it. But so that would be my alkene that I would pick from my, you know, my cupboard of all these various alkenes. I would grab this one here. Okay, 2-methyl-1-propene. And then I would treat it with this bor hydroboronation reaction here in order to get that particular alcohol. All right, so given that we have these two methods, one of which, which puts the OH group on the more substituted carbon, and the other one which puts it on the less substituted carbon, given an alcohol, we wanna sort of be able to work backwards to figure out what we would start with, right? So given a product, figure out what substrate and reagent we need to create that product, okay? Um, let's do one more. So the hydroboronation that's called a, what is it called again? It's, um... anti Markovnikov, is that what? Okay, so in this reaction here, this is the substrate, the alkene you start with, substrate. This is the reagent, the BH3, and this is the product, okay. the thing on the other side. Thank you. Yep. All right, so again, you can take any alkene you can think of treat it with some reagent and give me the following product. So for the sake of time, um, let's get started on this one. So uh, there's actually two equivalent ways to do this. You just got to pick your combinations correctly, all right? But you could have given me one of two answers that would have been perfectly correct here. Uh, importantly, my alkene is going to have one, two, three, four, five carbons. Okay. And this carbon here has to be involved in that double bond, right? Because that's what these reactions do. So I actually could have had two different alkenes that I could draw that would have a double bond on that carbon. One where it's on the end and one where it's in the middle, okay? And in this case, we could actually use either one to get to my product, 
but we'd have to be clever about which reagent we choose. So in this one here, let's just color these. This one's green. This one's red. And this one's blue. Okay. So again, in both of these cases, I need to add that OH group to my red carbon. In this one here, is that red carbon more or less substituted than the carbon on the other side of the double bond? More substituted. So if I'm gonna start with this alkene, I can get to this product, but I need to make sure to use my oxymercuration reaction. Um, all right. All right, and can I do it with this alkene over here? <clears throat> this one, yeah, exactly, right? So I couldn't use, I could start with this one here, but I couldn't use this same set of reagents because now it would put it on the green carbon because the green is the more highly substituted carbon, right? But I do have a way to put it on the less substituted carbon, and that would be using that hydroboronation reaction. So as long as I was clever about my alkene and my uh, reagent that I picked, I could use either one of these paths to get to that same product. All right, and practically speaking, when you come across this in the lab, what do you do? You pick the one that's easier, right? The one that's either easier or cheaper. Those are gonna be your considerations when you have two different equivalent ways. Cool, all right. Um, just be careful. One thing I want to just say, note, is with your OWL homework, just be careful because within the same problem set, some of them will ask you for the products of these, not these, the products of these reactions, and other ones will ask you for the intermediates in these reactions. So just read the question carefully so you make sure, you know, it's really easy to go into autopilot and do the same thing question after question, but it's actually asking you something different. So just be careful. Cool. All right, and like